So hopefully everyone will arrive safely to the session. Please say hello if you can hear me. Uh, and I'm uh, giving it over to Janine. Hello everyone. Welcome to this session at um, this week's R conference. I'm about to hand you over to Public Health Wales, who are going to talk to you about their rapid development of a multifaceted profile on the health and well-being to track and support planning for recovery from COVID-19 in Wales. We've got Bethan Patterson, who's an advanced public health intelligence analyst, and Rhys Powell, who's a senior public health intel intelligence analyst. So thank you. I'll just mute and hand over. Great, thanks very much. And we're going to try a little bit of um, technical wizardry. <laughs> so hopefully you'll be able to see my screen very shortly. Yeah, okay, so we're, we're really pleased to, to be here and for this opportunity to be able to share with you a little bit of our experience. I'm sorry, the title's really long, but basically um, we've produced this profile of health trends. We're quite excited to, to share with you um, just a little bit about our experience actually of doing that. So um, myself and Reese Powell will be presenting today just a little bit about us. We are um, from a team from Public Health Wales Observatory. We specialise in producing health data analyses um, to benefit the population of Wales. There's about 25 of us and we're scattered across, across Wales. Um, so a little bit just about the background of this tool before we try and do a live demo with you. So uh, with Planning for Recovery from COVID-19 in Wales, Public Health Wales came up with this model for a joined up response with a number of different objectives around um, identifying and minimising impacts on health, compliance to lockdown measures and monitoring health and wellbeing trends and also looking at the indirect um, as well as the direct impacts from COVID-19. So drawing on various uh, pieces of information to inform planning. So there was lots of lots of different tools um, uh, proposed to, to answer these objectives, which included a public engagement survey um, and an impact assessment. And where we come in is this profile of broader health trends. So health wellbeing and also bringing in things like wider determinants. So, uh, so the brief, what do we need to do? So it needed to be easily accessible and publicly available. We needed to be able to rapidly develop it, um, adding in different indicators, refreshing data as, as early as, as quick as possible. Um, it needed to be conducive to expansion and update. We needed to be able to bring together all of this data into one easily accessible place. We also needed to cater to multiple audiences. So we had, um, we've got local people who might want to know what's going on on the ground more locally, but also the executive type audience who might want a high level summary of Wales and what's going on. And then finally, what we needed to do was to provide meaningful insights, adding public health and um, public health value and really highlighting key patterns. So helping the user to really interpret what they're seeing. There's lots of tools out there which uh, kind of show the data, which is great. Um, but we really wanted to do help the user to interpret it and really highlight um, what was going on, what the key things that they needed to know. And part of this included adding caveats as well um, to, uh, to the data, so including that metadata. So in terms of the scope, what was this tool going to include? It was quite broad, it was quite, um, it was quite open really, there's quite a lot, a lot to be included. So we included deaths, we wanted to include information on other harms so things like service use, any attendances, uh, GP contacts, hospital admissions. We also wanted to capture interruptions to health services. So in Wales, um, some of our screening services were paused, uh, much like in other areas as well. So we wanted to capture, capture that. Um, also, well-being data, so how people were feeling about the things that were going on and um, behaviours that, that might have changed their mental well-being. And um, much of this came from the Public Health Wales Engagement Survey. So we went out and asked people um, how they were feeling about, about different things, like such as their finances and that. Um, and then finally, wider determinants of health as well. So bringing in things like ONS data into the tool. Um, on uh, data on the economy and also things like employment. We've also recently brought in immunisations data as well. That's a, that's quite a recent addition just in the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to try and switch my screen now to go to a live demo of the tool. And perhaps, uh, perhaps Reese as well, you could uh, just put a link to the tool. People might want to, to follow along perhaps. 
as well. Okay, so hopefully that's sharing. So, so when you load the tool, this is this is what it looks like. We are working on the database aspects of it, so it might look a little bit more engaging um, in future. Uh, as I said, obviously we've been rapidly developing this tool. So the the priority initially was just to get this tool out there, um, and then to then to improve it as we go along. So with each iteration, we've we've improved it. Uh, so after a little bit of introductory text about the tool itself and, and broadly what it includes, we then have these uh, these tabs. So these introduce the different topic areas that we have. So we use the tab set command for this. And then within these uh, these tabs, these main chapter topic areas, we then have sub chapters. So for example, with the mortality tab, we have um, deaths for the period. We have deaths uh, by week, if you want to have a look at death by week. It might take a little bit of time to load since we're over crowdcast. Um, excess mortality, place of death and underlying cause. So if we take um, excess mortality as an example, so after a little bit of interpretation text about some of the key patterns, um, we've got these selections, selection boxes. So there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a delay. Um, so this is really key for us. So as well as including high level patterns for whales, we wanted to be able to help our audience to be able to drill below that. So you might, uh, you might want to look at the health board level or the local authority and um, things like deprivation of fists and age groups. So a lot of our indicators in this tool can be broken down um, by, by other things below that national level. So that's really key. So if we were to go to health board, Again, this is a, a bit of a crowdcast delay, I'm afraid. Okay, well, it looks like it's going to take a little, a little while to load. Usually, this is pretty instantaneous. There we go, we can see it's. Okay, well, I'll leave it up there for a second, and hopefully, hopefully that will that will just update. There we go. So you can see that um, below the national level, very different patterns uh, patterns below that. So really important to to capture that. Um, as I said, over crowdcast is a little bit slow, but it should be should be fairly quick if you're trying this out yourself. So other features that we've got with this tool. So we've got um, download buttons, so you can capture this as, as a PNG image. So that will download for you, which you can use elsewhere. And then uh, a download data button as well. So all of the data within each indicator can be downloaded um, all in one go. So that's that's very handy. Um, another thing we've done is we've created these charts as uh, so initially as ggplot charts, but then uh, converted to Plotly. And what that does is it allows us to be able to have these nice little tool tips so that users can can see the data labels, which is which is a nice feature. And then uh, talking about important caveats, we've included a toggle which includes, again, this might take a little bit of time, there we go, uh, some extra metadata and information about the actual indicator itself. So things like uh, definitions, more about the uh, data source, and also some further information as well. That might include um, how, how the indicator is calculated and that sort of thing. And perhaps some links as well, if we've, if we've taken the data from, from somewhere else, we'll include links there to how you can get, get to the data. Um, and what's nice about this is that it can just be collapsed. So for, for users who just want to see the patterns and are not so bothered about the metadata, um, they don't get bogged down with that then. But for, for that more technical audience who want to know the extra information, it's easily accessible. We used to do this um, by massive documents where people would have to scroll through lots of information, but it's, it's nicely integrated now. Um, I guess one other feature just to draw your attention to as well, and um, this is something that we've used for some of the indicators, is, uh, is this reactive text. So to give you an example, um, so there's this sentence at the bottom of this particular indicator, which is about um, place of death. And it basically calculates the percentage of deaths from COVID-19 occurring in hospital and in care homes. Um, and what happens with this is that as you change your indicators, those figures will update. So in Betsy Caldwell, it's 80.4%. Um, and this is basically an object that we've created within the R script, uh, which basically calculates that and brings it brings it through to the RMD. Um, so, so yeah, this is a scrolling profile. We've uh, we've created it as a as an R markdown um, with Shiny for those um, user interactions. Uh, 
So that's a little bit about the tool. This is something you can go and have a look at yourself and scroll through. I often find that that's a, that's a more meaningful way of, of checking it out. And so I'd encourage you to do that um, via, via the link. So back to, back to the main presentation. Switch back. Okay, so a little bit about the project approach. So, um, so the way that we've done this, we had, a, we had a clear project brief, as I mentioned before, we had these domain areas, these topic areas that we wanted to include. And the next step for us then was to have a scoping phase. So to check out what data sources were out, of, were out there. Um, some things we already had direct access to, um, such as the ONS desk data. Um, so we had to assess then whether things were suitable for inclusion in this recovery profile. So things like, is the data regularly updated? Because our tool is going to be regularly updated. Um, is the is time series data available? Because we wanted to capture those trends. Is it coherent with other products? So this was really important. So there were lots of lots of tools out there and um, showing various things. What we wanted to make sure was that we weren't um, we weren't presenting two different versions of the truth. So this actually happened with um, with one of the indicators. Welsh government were were sharing a particular indicator in a particular way with a certain method, and we we were using a slightly different method. And actually, that's that's not helpful. So we brought that indicator into line with what Welsh government were um, were doing. So that was that was better all round. Uh, so then then we had to access the data. So either directly connecting through SQL or reading uh, different data downloads into R, bringing other data into R, um, and then cleaning and manipulating it before going on to analysing it, performing some statistical calculations, um, and then visualising it in Shiny, and, uh, and then adding those key pattern insights. So we took a modular approach to, to building this as well. Uh, this was quite a key thing for, for this project. Uh, basically, we, we created indicators in isolation from one another so that analysts could take a particular indicator, go away and produce it. Um, and it consisted of three separate things. So first, the data script, where all the data connections and calculations were going on, which then produced an RDS file, so that data file from those, um, from those calculations, and then a separate chart RMD. So three separate blocks coming together. And then finally, the chart RMD was read into our single master RMD, um, which is the basically the, the, end, the end profile script, which got run, and that's, and that's the final profile. So these things were all done in isolation and then read in. So that basically meant that there, were, um, there was little chance then for conflicts, and we weren't having to do massive copy and paste of, of various bits of script. Uh, the other thing that we did was we had a unique name in, name in system to make sure that when we brought the profile together that it wouldn't fall over when we did the final run. So, um, so for example, with the access desk, that was our mortality number five indicator. So every object, every script included mort5 um, as a unique reference. And this really, um, this really helped us to go a long way in making this quite a swift process. So now I'm going to hold, um, hand over to Rhys Powell, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the build. Thanks, Beth. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to give a, a quick walkthrough of um, how we built uh, the indicators. So I'm going to use our mortality 5 access death as an example. So I'm just going to be pointing out the main stages of the process uh, with some example code. Uh, obviously, this is quite a simplified version. Um, we'll be happy to answer any questions either here or, or through email um, after the conference. So first of all, um, I'm just going to look at some of the, the core packages. Um, so these are just like the main ones we use. Also, we use a lot more for very specific functions. So these are just sort of like the ones we enter the most. So we use dplyr for data manipulation, um, ODBC to connect directly into our SQL database, a week to work with weeks for a lot of stuff by weeks, so that helped us line our digs up nicely. Uh, ggplot2 and plotly we use for the chart creation side of things. And then shiny, shiny dashboard and shiny widgets for the sort of interactivity element um, on the actual online tool itself. So first of all, um, first step as always is actually getting some data. 
So uh, first step is to load in the packages. So in this one, um, OEBC, Tidy SNA, we put some, some big ones in important for us. And then once we have the packages we need, uh, of course we need to read in the actual data. So this data coming from ONS DES was already housed on our, our SQL database server. So we used ODBC to connect to SQL and then the function DB get query, uh, which allows us to write SQL code and execute it in R, which then we could just sort of bring with the code straight out, probably about to go in between programs and just streamline it a little bit more. Uh, we would also use read Excel and read.csv to read in local and online spreadsheets if the raw data was housed um, there. So once we have all this data in, we need to manipulate it. So we would use dplyr and occasionally base R to do this. Uh, so for example, that's just for filtering, cutting down data and summarizing. So in this one, we're using the group by command to summarize counts by the individual week numbers. Uh, and you can also use it to create more complex things um, such as ESR cal and EASR calculator, which we have done for other indicators. Sorry, Bruce, so five minutes. Okay, uh, so once we have the basic data ready, we can apply further calculations um, or analysis. So in this example, we're using dplyr to create a straightforward five-year average where we're summarizing, uh, summing up the individual years and dividing by five to get that average to compare the excess deaths. And then once that's complete, we just format it to get into the sort of agreed output. So that's looking at um, giving things nicer names and getting rid of any sort of junk columns that we no longer need for export. And then once that's ready, we can look at exporting it as an actual .rds file. Um, and as you can see here, it's got that more five prefix for best, but we we'll make sure there's nothing clashing uh, within the profile itself to cause R to fall over. So now that we have this data, we can actually go on to the sort of visualization stage. So the first step then again is to load in all the packages we need, in particular ggplot and plotly. Uh, we then read in the data RDS file that we just created and any other files we may need, such as the technical guide CSV, uh, which houses the tech guide toggle info that Beth highlighted earlier. And once we have that, we look at creating the interactive elements of the user drop downs um, and then setting the actual layout so where things are going to sit. So as you can see here, using the fluid row command, we got the text elements followed by the user inputs, followed by download buttons, and then below that we'll have the title and the actual charts. So now that we have the user inputs and we know exactly where everything's going to sit, we need to think about uh, where exactly uh, we need to think we're actually populating this content. So first we looked at creating a box of text, so let's just use page zero, we will just type in the, uh, the interpretation with some HTML format into the paragraphs. And if we have one of the reactive texts, it'll have um, the objects in there as well. We've known here that all these elements are created as functions. Um, this is necessary so that we can call the charts and the text into our Word document later, which I'll cover in a little bit. So that once this is done, we look at creating the charts. So this is a straightforward DG plot, so I won't go into too much detail about that. And then uh, when we're doing sort of line series data, um, we would then convert it over to Plotly, which um, allows us to bring in those sort of tool tips and that interactive element. So moving on to master R and D scripts. So this was really a key thing for us and a big goal for us to integrate in order to sort of streamline the process. The actual master script is relatively straightforward. Uh, we have a YAML at the top, which is a fairly regular one. Um, so we call in the CSS file in order to apply some styling. And then we also have a runtime shiny command. So it knows there's gonna be interactive elements. We then have the dot tab set commands, which allows R, R to know that we're going to be having that um, tab layout and allows us to have that format that we that we have in the final profile. And then each individual indicator has its own chunk where it uses this child command where child equals mort 5 chartrmd to call in the actual charts. So what this is doing is it tells when the script gets to it, it tells it to run off, find that chart, try and find that script, run it, and then populate the results in this section. And that's what really allows us to sort of scale it up and keep everything a lot more manageable. So moving on to the Word report, um, so it works in quite a similar way to the, the master RMD in where it's just one script calling in different elements to make it a work as a whole. So the individual charts and text, they're called in via the functions we created earlier. There's then a Word document template, which we use for styling, so our fonts, headers, and things like that. And then there's our code we use to create um, a table of contents to allow the users to navigate a bit easier. Then a separate Word document RMD calls all these little bits in, and then the master RMD script, when someone hits download, it runs, goes off, 
runs the Word document and it pulls it all together into a Word document so whoever use it can download it. And I'm going to hand you back over to Beth to just go over our findings. Beth, we're almost out of time. We've got one minute left, if you can wrap up really quickly. And we've got a lot of interest and some really good questions that have come in, but I think we just need to take those offline. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, I guess just to wrap up with uh, what we learned really. So uh, wherever possible, connect directly to data sources, makes it so much easier for update. Um, we started using much more use of uh, functional programming, so creating uh, creating objects for things like data updates and stuff like that. Um, and just standardizing outputs, having agreed formats, um, and then formalizing checks. So this is something that we We've, we're developing more of now um, going back and adding in extra underlying data checks just so that when it comes to update things, things go a lot smoother. Um, so yeah, and modularization, that's, that's been huge for us as well. It's made it, made it uh, possible to, to refresh this tool. We've, we've created about, well, we're on phase seven now, so we've done seven versions of this tool um, in a couple of months. So it really has been quite speedy development for us. And um, yeah, just a, a big thanks to the team. So if there are any questions. There are some questions. I think the most important one is, um, actually, could this be turned into a workshop, please? But I just need to say, I'm really sorry, but we need to jump off and head into the next workshop. A huge thank you, a brilliant presentation, loads of interest, and I'll have a chat with Anastasia and Mohammed later about how we can follow it up and potentially turn it into a workshop. And a really important question from Zoe, which is, um, is the code shareable? <laughs> So we are we are working on that. It's it's not shareable right now, but if um, we we can definitely work to share that. We've we've already uh, started working on a minimal example of of the code, and um, so yeah, it is shareable, but it's just not actually available right this second. But we we can work with you with that. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as Jenny said, we now go to next session. Sorry that we have to cut it best and race, but uh, I'm sure you, you should be able to answer um, Dominic's question about the package offline or here in the chat. And for everyone, we will see you in the next session.